OK, so um, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker for the day. Um, this is Dr. Mark Spectorman, who's a friend and colleague from St. George's. Uh, Dr. Spectorman is a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist, and his research interest really is in the pathophysiology underlying the arrhythmia syndromes. Uh, welcome, Mark, and thank you very much for joining us. Hi. Can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'll just share my slide. You can see my title slide, I hope. We can indeed. OK. Hello everyone, thanks for the int uh, introduction, Chris and Liam. Um, uh, this is me, uh, as you said, and, and my academic interests lie in the cellular electrophysiological mechanisms of arrhythmogenesis. And I'll work through with you as quickly as I can uh, the pathophysiology of the ECG features of the inherited arrhythmia syndromes. The inherited arrhythmia syndromes are disorders of cardiomyocyte depolarization and or repolarization with ensuing abnormalities in calcium homeostasis, uh, but in the presence of a structurally normal heart. The cardiac action potential is the summation of the flow of sodium, potassium, and calcium ions through their respective ion channels and exchange proteins. And the action potential consists of four phases, numbered red here, with ionic flow inwards to the cell depicted by the downward arrows and outwards uh, the upward arrows. The ionic flow uh, occurs across the cardiomyocyte sarcolemma um, and the intracellular sarcoplasmic reticulum. And depolarization transforms the cell membrane at rest from a negative potential difference to a positive one by the inward uh, sodium and calcium ionic flow. Uh, and this leads to release um, of calcium ions from the sarco sarcoplasmic reticulum um, via calcium induced calcium release through ryanidine receptors. And ryandine receptors are themselves modulated as part of a complex called the dyad by modulatory proteins such as calmodulin, calcisequestrin, triadin, and uh, FK506 binding protein is depicted here. And the binding of calcium to intracellular myofilaments then leads to cardiomyocyte contraction. Sodium and calcium ions are then extruded throughout the action potential via this really important um, exchanger, the sodium calcium uh, exchanger. And this is a crucial player in calcium homeostasis. The sodium calcium exchanger is itself electrogenic. And in what's termed forward mode, um, three sodium ions move inward for every one calcium ion outward. And this provides inward positive current. Fluctuations in forward or reverse mode of the sodium calcium exchanger are driven by electrochemical gradients of sodium and calcium during the action potential. At times of forward mode, the action potential is prolonged, and during reverse mode, the sodium calcium exchanger contributes to repolarization. But also, because calcium is coming in, into the cell, this loads the sarcoplasmic reticulum with calcium even more. Calcium ions are also uh, sequestrated into the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the, the circa ATPase pump, which is itself modulated by this protein called phospholambin. And then uh, potassium ions will flow out to repolarize the cell in phase three. The electrical forces driving activation and repolarization across the whole heart are then summated by their compound representation on the surface 12 EDTG. And crudely, uh, the QRS is produced by phase zero of the action potential, the ST segment phase two, and the T wave phase three. And dispersion of repolarization time gives rise to a potential difference between spatially distinct areas of the heart, giving rise to the T wave. It's crucial to remember that there's an inherent spatial heterogeneity of repolarization across the myocardium. And some models, uh, like the canine wedge preparation, have demonstrated this transmurally within about within crudely three layers of, of uh, the myocardium, the endocardium, mid myocardial wall and epicardium leading to inscription of the T wave due to dispersion of repolarization across these layers. 
more recently using human epicardial ECGI mapping with a vest consisting of over 200 uh, electrograms fiducially mapped to an epicardial CT created shell has demonstrated that activation recovery gra gradients are shorter anterobasally as indicated by this red color and longer posterior apically uh, as indicated by the blue color. And this also defines the spatial dispersion of repolarization. Channelopathy can occur where variants lead to disturbances at any stage of the transcription, translation, packaging and trafficking to the cell membrane or function and gating of the ion channel at the cell membrane. The mechanism of a variant can be explored at all of these stages by various techniques, including RNA expression, immunocytochemistry, calcium imaging and patch clamp. Patch clamp involves lowering very fine pipettes under microscopy down onto an isolated cell surface and measuring ionic currents from those cells. In the long QT syndrome, genetic variants and susceptibility genes lead to an imbalance favoring more depolarizing inward current than repolarizing outward current. Approximately 75% of long QT syndrome patients carry an identifiable variant in one of the 17 associated long QT syndrome susceptibility genes. But of these, 90% are made up of the three major long QT syndrome types, type one, types one to three. Long QT syndrome type one is caused by mutations in KCNQ1, which encodes the poor forming subunit carrying the IKS potassium current, characteristic, characteristically giving a broad based P wave. Long QT2 is caused by loss of function mutations in KCNH2, encoding the poor forming subunit carrying the IKR potassium current, and this characteristically gives a notched T wave. Long QT3 is caused by gain of function mutations in SCN5A, encoding the poor subunit carrying the sodium current, where there is an increase in the persistent or late sodium current, prolonging the plateau phase of the action potential. And this characteristically gives a long ST segment. Diagnostically, the end of the T wave can be defined by drawing a tangential line to the steepest slope of the last limb of the T wave, best in lead two or lead five. And the end of the T wave is the intersection of the tangent with the baseline. A consistent finding of a Bazet's corrected QT interval of greater than 480 milliseconds is diagnostic. However, corrected QT ranges exist that when combined with other features on the Schwartz score can also give a diagnosis. The mechanism of polymorphic VT and VF is due to early after depolarization. EADs that occur with action potential prolongation before repolarization is complete. And this is more likely to occur after a pause and longer diastolic period as more calcium is taken up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum ready for release, leading to a longer action potential on the post pause beat, the so called long short phenomenon. A prolonged phase two and phase three leads to reactivation of the inward calcium current and the subsequent increase in intracellular calcium leads to calcium extrusion via this crucial sodium calcium exchanger that I was describing previously. And thus forward mode inward current via that sodium calcium exchanger then leads to a new action potential and premature ventricular contraction. And if this is critically timed, it may lead to degeneration to polymorphic BT or VF. As mentioned previously, there's an inherent spatial dispersion of repolarization across the heart, and this becomes accentuated in the inherited arrhythmia syndromes, such as the long QT syndrome, and this is crucial to the promotion of arrhythmia. The IKS current is recru recruited during higher heart rate, and this is because the molecular correlate pore is slow to both activate and deactivate, though activation is quicker with beta agonistic augmentation. And here you can see the recording of the IKS current with patch clamp from a canine cardiomyocyte building up through repeated stimulation on the left and with isoprenaline augmentation on the right. And for this reason, deficiencies in IKS and arrhythmias in long QT type one are classically uncovered during exercise or stress. IKR is the predominant repolarizing current at rest. And in this rabbit model, it can be seen that through repeated measures during a continuous isoprenaline infusion, peak inward calcium current is augmented quicker than IKS. Remember that inward current is depicted with negative magnitude by convention. 
Therefore, with surges of sympathetic drive, such as an abrupt standing or abrupt stressors like alarm clocks, IKR is required to counter the augmentation of calcium current. And with IKR deficiency, arrhythmias in long QT2 classically happen under such circumstances. In long QT3, higher heart rate leads to a buildup of intracellular sodium that inhibits the late sodium current due to a reduced electrochemical gradient for sodium to travel inward to the cell. It also leads to reverse mode of the crucial sodium calcium exchanger, and this leads to outward current. And IKS accumulates at higher heart rate, remember. So taken together, this means that arrhythmias are more likely to happen during slower heart rate and increased vagal tone in long QT type three. Gain of function variants in potassium channel genes encoding the IKR, IKS, and IK1 currents, leading to an imbalance of outward repolarizing current and shortened action potential duration have been associated with the short QT phenotype. And one would use the tangential method and a consistent finding of a Bazet's corrected QT interval of less than 340 milliseconds is diagnostic or less than 360 milliseconds with other supporting factors. This is also contingent on no other confounding reversible cause like electrolyte disturbance, such as hypercalcemia, for example. Shortened action potential duration promotes re-entry as a mechanism for arrhythmia, but again, it is the accentuated dispersion of repolarization across the myocardium that promotes arrhythmia. For the above reason, both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias are encountered in the short QT syndrome. Only a spontaneous and fulminant type 1 Brugada ECG pattern is diagnostic of the, is diagnostic of the Brugada syndrome. And this is characterized by a coved ST segment elevation displaying J point and ST segment elevation greater or equal to 2 millimeters or 0 0.2 millivolts, followed by negative T wave. And this can be in any right precordial lead, V1 to V3, in either the second, third, or fourth intercostal space. The repolarization Brugada theory places early repolarization in some areas of the right ventricular outflow tract epicardium due to expression of a higher density of a current called ITO. Um, and this would oppose a reduced inward current in action potential phase one due to loss of function variance in SCN5A or other inward currents, encoding the, uh, an SCN5A encodes the, the poor forming subunit of the sodium channel. The theory is that this leads to a lower amplitude action potential with phase two dome loss in some areas of the RV epicardium, whereas in other areas, this leads to an accentuation of the phase one notch due to unopposed ITO current and a delay in the dome of phase two. In combination, uh, this causes J-point elevation and T-wave inversion due to a transmural voltage difference between the endocardium and the epicardium in this RV outflow tract region as depicted by the schematic here. A voltage gradient between epicardial regions then theoretically allows us a, a, something termed phase two re-entry between the heterogeneous uh, la epicardial layers leading to re-entrant arrhythmia within these epicardial layers. The depolarization theory suggests a slow, the depolarization theory rather on the other hand, suggests a slower action potential upstroke and delayed activation of the RVOT epicardium. And this may be due to ITO opposed reduced inward current, though there is a complex macromolecular arrangement at the intercalated disc coupling cardiomyocytes, and areas of fibrosis and reduced connexin expression have been demonstrated in Brugada syndrome hearts where slowed conduction may then drive re-entrant arrhythmias. Wild type sodium channels have reduced peak current amplitude and faster kinetics of inactivation at higher temperatures, and this is accentuated in mutant channels. In these patch clamp experiments, sodium channels are expressed in the cell model. Remember, by convention, inward current is negative in magnitude, and you can just about make out the relative reduced peak and steeper slope of inactivation in these current traces at 32 degrees compared to 22 degrees. And in the bottom traces, squares, if you can make them out, are wild type uh, channels and circles, mutant channels. And the time constant for ink to inactivation is shorter at higher temperatures and more so in the mutant to all voltages. This translates then into why in some cases, patients have only a provoked type one Brugada ECG pattern, for example, in the presence of a fever and in other cases, offending drugs. 
Indeed, those with only a provoked type 1 ECG pattern require other factors, such as symptom history, family history, or genetic status, to receive a formal diagnosis of the Brugada syndrome. Arrhythmias tend to occur during periods of high vagal tone, most probably due to less adrenergic, adrenergic augmentation of inward sodium and calcium currents, and also ITO inhibition afforded by adrenergic drive. In these experiments, KV4.3 protein subunits that are the human molecular correlate of ITO were expressed in a cell model, and currents were measured via patch clamp under control conditions, and then when perfused with phenylephrine, um, which are the filled circles. And this led to current inhibition, as you can see here. In this series of experiments, the canine wedge preparation is used again with action potentials recorded from the different myocardial layers. A is control, and from B, an ITO agonist is perfused with verapamil, the calcium channel blocker, to induce a slower action potential upstroke and peak amplitude, together with either shortened action potential uh, duration in epicardial layer two, or pronounced notch and action potential prolongation in epicardial layer one that then leads to this um, phenomenon of phase two reentry between the epicardial layers that you can see in column D. Isoprenaline is then co-perfused that leads to homogenization of action potential morphology in column E before washout of isoprenaline and further arrhythmia in column F. And these uh, experiments also demonstrate this proposed mechanism of, of phase two entry between the epicardial layers, which is part of the repolarization theory. The proposed mechanisms of Brugada syndrome are synonymous with the early repolarization syndrome, characterized by the presence of NQRS notching or slurring due to J-point elevation and the presence of arrhythmic syncope or polymorphic BT LVF. And this will be noticed classically in the infralateral leads, and it's proposed to be due to transmural heterogeneity in the expression of ionic currents, again, particularly ITO in the inferior and lateral walls of the myocardium, together with loss of function variance in inward, in inward currents or gain of function of outward potassium current. It must be stressed though that evidence so far is only in association and no causative genetic, genetic mechanism is formally proven. In some series, a horizontal or descending ST segment has been associated with higher risk, but equally, the ECG finding is common in the general population and particularly amongst athletes. And so the true meaning needs to be placed in the context of concurrent arrhythmias and family history. Further, and, and this slide is not meant to be read through in entirety, but just to give a sense that there are numerous confounding factors that are known to lead to the ECG changes associated with the Brugada or early repolarization pattern that would then go against an inherited cause. The classic bidirectional VT of CPVT is produced by alternating delayed after depolarizations between the right and left bundle branches that are adrenergically driven calcium store overload induced calcium releases or soica for short, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium uh, leak from the SR is caused by defects in the proteins of the dyad, which is uh, the complex that controls calcium release from the SR. And in around 60% of patients, this is caused by variants in the ryanodine receptor itself, that is the pore forming protein in this complex. Other proteins implicated uh, are calcioquestrin, calmodulin, and triad triadine, that to modulate the ryandine receptor. And delayed after depolarizations are due to spontaneous releases of calcium from an overloaded SR due to leaky dyads that then lead to calcium extrusion from the cytolol by the crucial sodium calcium exchanger. But in doing so, of course, this then leads to a net inward current, and this can lead to a new critically timed action potential. As the name of the, of the condition would suggest, the delayed after depolarizations are adrenergically driven because this modulates rinding receptors into being leakier still. And so the bidirectional VT is commonly documented via exercise tests. anderson toil syndrome type 1 consists of a triad of periodic potassium sensitive muscle paralysis, dysmorphic bony facial features, and cardiac repolarization abnormalities and arrhythmias. And it's caused by loss of function variants in casein J2 encoding CUR 2.1 that carries the IK1 current. And this current is the most important at setting the resting membrane potential and ma maintaining membrane stability in phase four. The repolarization abnormalities are characterized by prominent U waves, particularly in V2 to V4, with often a prolonged downslope of the T wave and clear TU junction. 
Whereas it's often termed a type of long QT syndrome, the QT interval itself is commonly normal. And this is therefore a bit of a misnomer. The QTU interval, on the other hand, is often very prolonged. And the U wave is probably a manifestation of an unstable diastolic membrane potential due to the lack of IK1. The arrhythmia seen is, is similarly to CPVT, classically a bidirectional VT. And CPVT phenotypes can also be accompanied by prominent U waves on the resting ECG, in particular with those, uh, uh, in particular in those with variants in calmodulin and triadin. When VF occurs in the absence of any cardiomyopathic structural or other reversible cause, and all ECG phenotypes of the inherited arrhythmia syndromes have been excluded, it's termed idiopathic VF, and the ECG can be completely normal. VF is commonly initiated by a short coupled PVC, initiating from well within the preceding T wave, or coupled to less than 300 milliseconds from the preceding R wave. And these PVCs have been shown to originate from Purkinje fiber myocytes that have altered calcium handling properties compared to ventricular myocytes. And so this is my attempt at summation for you. Uh, spatial dis dispersion of repolarization via transmural, apico-basal, and anteroposterior gradients define the ST segment, T wave morphology, and QT interval. And repolarization is governed by a delicate balance of inward and outward currents. Disturbances of these currents and calcium homeostasis can lead to a net increase or decrease in repolarization time, leading to re-entry or after depolarizations in ventricular arrhythmia. Sorry if I've overrun. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you for that enlightening uh, talk. I think it's important that we all understand the principles underlying these conditions. Um, I just have a question for you, just looking at the J-wave syndrome, specifically Brigada syndrome and early repolarization. Um, do you think that the pathophysiological mechanisms can differ between individuals who may have the same sort of ECG appearance or ECG phenotype? Yes, absolutely. Um, as, as, as I tried to allude to, um, the, the ECG phenotype is merely a, a representation of the combination of the imbalance between inward and outward currents. So whatever the, the, the fault is, um, uh, wherever it's occurring, you, you can, it may cause the same ECG pattern between different patients with different variants and different ion channels. Um, whether we'll ever go on to be able to unpick very, very subtle differences in ST segment morphology um, uh, or T wave morphology on an ECG that then define the true underlying specific variants remains to be seen. And we have one question which uh, may be answered later on in the day, uh, but there's a question here about what is the preferred method for calculating the corrected QT interval? Well, by, uh, by the, the definition would be to use the, the Bassett uh, corrected formula, but um, as we know, there, there are deficiencies uh, for using that at the extremes of heart rate, and there are other methods to, uh, to, to correct the QT interval, but um, I think the, the, the correct thing to do would be to look at serial ECGs, um, uh, and, and uh, one would use the Bazitz corrected formula looking for consistencies in QT prolongation over serial ECGs and ideally not use ECGs with extremes of heart rate. OK, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Lovely, thank you very much. We hope you can join us for the panel discussion at the end of the, the first session uh, as well. Thank you, uh, Mark.